So yeah, I'm basically here in Amsterdam, as I said before, and uh, I kind of live um, between Formia, which is my hometown, is like between Roman Naples, uh, right on the sea, and Amsterdam. And uh, I come from the jazz world, or for what it means, I don't know. But uh, you know, I play. I started with jazz drums, and uh, then slightly went to electronics a bit more in the last year. And um, so I applied for this master's in at the conservatory in Amsterdam, and I'm doing it. And um, it's it's nice so far. It's been nice. I mean, we're doing a lot of stuff like Max MSP lessons and uh, also Arduino and Teensy stuff a bit. So it's really interesting. And but I'm not super into it yet. So I thought it might be interested uh, interesting to. Um, I mean to have this chat, this session, and uh, since I'm really interested in like in your work and what I saw, like I actually I uh, randomly discovered you like uh, through the sensory percussion forum, like yeah. what, what where you posted, you know, some stuff uh, about the Max MSP integration, and then I went on your YouTube channel and discovered all the things, and uh, <laughs> it was really nice and. Um, so I thought it might be interesting to to share some ideas with you on improvisation and composition or whatever the use of live of live electronics in general on drums and uh, and um, one another uh, one other thing is uh, that for like the research for my masters I'm thinking about focusing on uh, like corpus based concatenative synthesis like I mean I'm not into it but I want to go deeper you know and um, I don't know it's just a, a, a word that attracts me a lot and um, I thought it was super interesting what you what you did with it and uh, I don't know I thought it might be interesting like to to talk with you about it and um, if you like could explain what it is to you how did you discover it and uh, I don't know how how does it work you know, uh, <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah. like the basics or whatever, you know. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff that's like exactly up my alley, like a lot of like shared interest and shared overlap. So, yeah, we'll definitely unpack a bunch of that stuff. Um, so in terms of the setup, so like I guess you you ha you bought some of the center percussion stuff. Do you have like one, two, like what, how many do you have? I, I have three actually. Okay. And, yeah, and um, I don't know, I was, I, I was, trying to work with some of the patches that you sent to me um, but it kind of didn't work uh, I mean I I tried it on both Mac and Windows and the I cannot get the entry matcher object you know the, I, the, that's for the corpus uh, thing yeah, yeah. you know and so it didn't work and I also wanted to ask you how um, did you manage to to use sensory percussion in Max without the software, or if you, or, yeah. or if you use it with the software or not? Because yeah. I didn't manage to do to do it. So um, I first saw the sensory percussion thing, I guess a, a few, four, three or four years ago. Like I, there was like an Ian Chang video and like an article where like it shows him and he's playing a setup with like the lights and uh, spiritual leader, I think it is. And I saw that and I was like, the video is awesome because at the time I was doing a lot of stuff with um, onset detection and lighting. So like a lot of things that were kind of like that. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting and not really understanding what was happening with the technology, but then reading the article, I was like, oh, cool. They're doing like machine learning and classification. And that seemed uh, quite exciting and they're not very cheap. So I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. But it's like, oh, I can't, I can't justify paying like $400 or whatever it is for 
basically a drum trigger. And then after a while they went on sale. So I bought one of them and I got it and I kind of played with it a little bit, but I didn't, um, because I a hundred percent didn't want to use, um, the, the core of their software. Like I didn't want to, cause I have so many samples and so many setups and all that kind of stuff. And their system is built around like a, a, kind of a walled garden. Like you have our sensor, you have our sampler, and this is what you use to make music. And for certain kinds of stuff, that's great. But I didn't want to have to like put all my samples in their uh, in their software and basically recreate my setup there. Yeah. Not to mention there's stuff that I wouldn't have been able to do. So um, I got it. I played with it a bit, and I was like, all right, that's fine. And one of the first things I did was I made a patch that, um, which I I don't remember if I sent you or not, but I can send it to you. Where basically um, it sends everything from their software into Max, and then I have it in Max to receive everything. So all the different um, zones you can train, all the different controllers. And I set that up, and that works kind of pretty well. Um, there's a little bit of latency in terms of doing stuff, but it was kind of fine. And then, um, But you still have to use the software for that patch? For that patch, yes. Okay. Yeah, and I'll, I can show you that. Actually... I've not used their software. I think, you software. Sent, I think you sent it to me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't really do anything. It just receives MIDI, basically. But I just made it kind of like a little interface so I can kind of see what's what and map everything. So my initial approach was maybe that. I'll use their software, but then I'll, I'll use my own stuff in Max. But sometimes because, I don't know for whatever reason, but I guess sending MIDI from app to app, sometimes I would get like really big drops in latency and, and weird stuff. And I was like, this is a pain in the ass. And then I left it and I didn't do much with that for a while. And then for a while, I wanted to um, try to figure out a way to, to try to do what their software was doing, but not using their software. So I got involved with this machine learning project and I thought, okay, maybe I can try to recreate some of the stuff, but in Max. And at the time, I wasn't 100% wasn't able to do that because the tools at the moment, at the time, um, were more based around deco deco uh, decomposing signals, not necessarily for doing classification and things. Um, but very early on, even when I got the Century Percussion pickup, I did testing because since it comes in as an audio, like you plug in an audio cable and you turn on phantom power, I was like, surely this comes in as audio. So I did a lot of testing at the beginning, like recording the audio from it, because it, 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 it's literally, a, it works as a microphone. So you get audio. It sounds terrible. Well, not that bad, but like it doesn't sound good, but like it comes in as audio. So I thought, okay, maybe I can do something with that. And I played with it for a while, and it, it took me a while to get something going, but I finally got something where I had um, super, super, super good, like, onset detection, which was something that I've been kind of working on for a long time to try to get that really good. And I guess one of the main things that their sensor allows, because it's basically a hall sensor, which is, that's why you put the little magnetic thing on your, or a piece of metal on your head, and there's basically a magnetic sensor that's picking up the vibrations of that. Um, but it means it gives you very, very clear. I don't know if you've ever looked at the audio um, from it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah super so clear do. transients and uh, like that kind of thing. Yeah, I, yeah. But uh, it's, it's not a really good microphone, but uh, uh, I think it's super clear. You know, like uh, yeah, yeah. what it detects. And can you can you um, explain what onset detection is like the defi yeah. a definition or you know yeah, yeah. Like whatever. So there's a couple different ways to do this. So. Um, detecting when a sort of a signal has changed or an event has happened. The way that I generally do it for drum bass stuff is doing this by amplitude, meaning that like when the amplitude goes above a certain amount, something has possibly happened. Okay. Um, what most like, like, I guess like a vanilla drum trigger from like, like a MIDI trigger from like the eighties or nineties, what it would often do is you'd have like a threshold. So like if the volume goes above this amount, we have a trigger. Um, and that works because normally let's say like you have like your you plug in like your drum trigger It's just a contact microphone and a piece of rubber um, This the there's not a lot of additional noise because it's a contact mic yeah. When you have a microphone microphone um, So like even just these mics I'm talking right now So right now I'm speaking and the volume is kind of up here because I'm constantly talking. So if I say something loud um, It'll it might go above the threshold, but I might be talking at a level that's kind of near the threshold so the way that I do it is you do a, a amplitude differential, meaning that there's like basically an envelope follower, um, like uh, kind of like what a compressor is doing or something. So it's just following the signal. So there's one that's going slow. So if I'm talking loudly for a while, it's moving up. And if I stop talking, okay. it slowly moves down. So it's basically slowly following me around. And then there's another one that's much faster. 
that kind of follows me at every point like this. And then what you do is you subtract one from the other. So if I'm kind of loud, and then all of a sudden there's a big change, um, I'm measuring the difference between the one envelope and the other. So meaning if, I, if I'm kind of already kind of loud and I'm here and I'm loud and I clap, that clap will stand out from that one thing. Okay, if that makes kind of sense. So that's doing a, like an amplitude based differential thing. And the good thing about this is that you can have a very, very, very short latency. It's almost um, instant because basically it's the amount of time that one envelope separates from the other. Okay, okay, I see. So in, in my case, I have it tuned. I think the, the short envelope is like five samples. It's, it's something ridiculously short. So the amount of time from when wherever this one is to the other one goes like that. And then boom, it says this is an onset. And then there's all sorts of other things that you can do. So for example, if I like, um, if I'm talking or I do a bunch of things like this, um, that might be, it might make too many onsets. So what you normally do is you lock it out. So like if there's an onset, ignore everything else for a certain amount of time. Okay, okay, I see. Um, there's other ways to do it as well. So um, for drums, we have it kind of easy and that basically, volume is a big thing for us and if we hit a drum there's like a sharp attack and it's a transient um if you play something like a tuba or a violin or some other kind of instrument where the transient is kind of soft it's like um the bigger difference might be in the timbre of the notes so you can look at onsets where you look at um instead of uh loudness you look at like timbre or pitch or other characteristics okay. but those um add a little bit of latency because you have to do like a window of analysis so, um, so that's basically the, the thing. So for years I've been working on getting like a uh, onset detection algorithm that works really well across a bunch of the things I do. Yeah. Um, and I think I have, I have one that I'm very happy with now that's super responsive. If I use the sensory percussion pickup as well, I can do like press rolls and buzz rolls and you get like, brrr, and you get all of those, okay. which is fantastic, which the main nice thing with using the sensory percussion for that is because since you have those clear transients, each one of those sticks out from the envelope. Yeah, okay, on, okay, um, it's super, so it's super clear. Whereas I normally have like a DPA microphone next to the drum and even if like I'll hit the drum, there was a sharp spike, but there's still like the sound of the drum is still pretty loud. So if, even if I do something like, oh, like all those other ones, the volume is still quite high. So the kind of the decay of it masks the ability to do that. All of that is to say that like with just a DPA, I've never been able to get like that kind of level of tracking. I can get close, but I can't get all of those. Whereas with the sensory percussion, I can get like way faster than that, which is fantastic. Uh -huh. e e even if you don't have like anything on the, on the on the snare drum, for example, like even if you have all the harmonics going through, you, you get um, a super clear, super clear transients. Well, that's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's super cool. I mean, that's what I thought uh, as well. Like, I mean, not at, at this level, but um, like, I don't want to be stuck with uh, with the plugin or with uh, with, with the software. You know, I I, I think it, it's it's a um, really powerful instrument and tool, and um, of course, there's a way to 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 use it. You know, at one hundred percent potential. You know. I'll show you some patches and I think I might have given you some patches, but I can kind of explain them in more detail of like taking the signal from the sensor percussion and the settings I found that worked really well, like certain filter shapes and everything just to get like a very clear signal and a very clear onset. So that's yeah. the one thing, like having super clear transients coming from the sensor percussion and that you can do in Max very easily. Then from that point, the the two main things I've done um, one is like what the sensory percussion does is you kind of train a classifier, meaning that um, whatever whatever descriptor analysis stuff they're doing, um, you give it a bunch of examples. Like here's the snare in the center. Here's the snare hitting the hoop and all this. And you train a class. And then when you give it new information, it says, okay, that's probably this class or that class. Um, the sensory percussion stuff just does this for you. And it does it for, I think theirs is also probably really optimized for uh, like acoustic drums, snare, kick toms, um, with certain uh, limitations and characteristics of what that means. Um, the nice thing about something doing it in Max is that you can kind of do whatever, um, yeah. but the downside is that like you can do whatever. So like, you know, there's no training wheel, so things can kind of get 
a little bit more difficult sometimes. Yeah, but I, I guess you can fine tune it to the point where you need it. Maybe I don't know. It, it, it's like you can get something out of it. You know, you could you could I don't know put it somewhere in in the space and uh, you know train it to steps or whatever. You know, I'm talking nonsense, but you know, <laughs> just movements or whatever. I, I I think it could be interesting. You know, like mm -hmm. so it's a really, really interesting approach. Yeah. Yeah. So um, there's doing classifying, which is which is what the the center percussion software does, and then you can assign samples, or you can do whatever based on those classifiers, like just like you can in the center percussion. In Max, you you can obviously do a lot more things because once you know, like, okay, I've hit the center, I've hit the drum in the center. Now trigger lights. Now do whatever. Like you you can do whatever you want with that information. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that, and this is something I've been working on since before I got the center percussion, is that I wanted to be able to um, have more information about what happened when I hit the drum. So with most like like MIDI triggers or whatever, you hit the drum, it tells you something happened. So that's the onset. And then it also tells you the velocity. Like you hit a drum, but this loud. And you usually get between zero and 127 or whatever. And that's super common. You can do that with uh, like onset detection as well. But that's usually all you get. So I wanted to be able to have something where I could have some more information about it. So some audio descriptors. So for the case of drums and percussion, common ones are all well, loudness um, with greater detail than um, MIDI resolution, but then also something like spectral centroid, which is, I don't know if you've done any stuff with descriptors at all, have you? No, no. And uh, actually, could you like define yeah. a little bit descriptors as well? Because I'm yeah. pretty new to it, but uh, I'm really yeah. interested. So audio descriptors in general, um, it's it's something that has some characteristics about describing the sound. So if sound happens and we can be like, okay, that was this loud or that was this note or that was this bright or that had this, right? There's, there's dozens upon dozens, if not hundreds of descriptors. They're not all useful for all the time. They might do specific things, but it's basically a, a way of, of analyzing and describing a bit of sound, okay? Common ones are loudness and pitch. Mm -hmm. So it's something like a, it's a pitch tracker. It's doing, um, it's an audio descriptor of pitch. We just don't normally call it an audio descriptor. So in a general sense, it just means it's something that describes the sound. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. In, in a more technical sense, there is some that are more um, useful to the kind of stuff that musicians want to do. And, and there's a kind of a slight difference here. So there's something that, so like loudness, we understand something sounds louder. Like, oh, that sounds louder. We look at the numbers, they'll move in that way. Loudness yeah. makes sense. Pitch to something it's like, oh, that's a higher pitch. I can hear it as a higher pitch and the numbers move up and down. Then you get into things like kurtosis and, and some MFCCs and these other kind of descriptors that to you and me, even if we were to look at the numbers, are mean nothing. Like I kind of know what's supposed to be happening, but I can look at MFCCs, which is a type of descriptor, and the numbers mean nothing to me. To the computer, they're great. The computer's like, oh, that's different from this in like this very complicated way, but it doesn't, it's not perceptually relevant, meaning that like we can't see that. Some of them are a little bit in the middle. So one of them is um, spectral centroid, which what it means is, um, so imagine like, so here's my screen. Uh, you know, like when you see like an EQ that like kind of moves around, if you have more highs, it's over here and more lows and all that. And you see this kind of movement. Um, what spectral centroid is, is where the center of that energy is. Mm. So if I hit like a, a, like a crotale or something really bright, the centroid is going to be quite high. Okay. okay. If I hit like a bass drum, the centroid is probably going to be quite low. Okay. Cause it's sort of roughly where the middle of the energy is. Sometimes that's a little tricky because if you have something that's like shaped like this, mm -hmm. um, with a lot of highs and a lot of lows, the centroid will still be here because it's the middle of the, the thing, so it's not perfect. But generally speaking, the higher the centroid of something is, the brighter it sounds. Okay. Okay, so spectral centroid I find very useful. And then another one is spectral flatness, which this one's a little, a little counterintuitive, but it basically it tells you how flat the signal is. So if a signal has a lot of points like this, um, it's more likely to be pitchier material and if it's something that's flatter like this, it's kind of more like white noise. Um, if you picture white noise, it's like this. So the numbers are kind of a little inverted, but it basically tells you how noisy something is. 
Okay. All right. So um, those are the four main descriptors that I most often use. So loudness, which we understand, pitch, which we can understand, it's less useful for drums, um, centroid, and then flatness, which I generally call noisiness or whatever. So um, with those descriptors, you can kind of tell a lot about a sound. So if you look at the numbers and I can see, okay, the loudness looks high, the pitch is low, um, the spectral centroid is kind of high and the flatness is this, you can kind of almost imagine what that sound sounds like. Not exactly, but the numbers kind of, they, they correlate to our perception. They kind of perfect pitch of, you know, I don't know. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's super but it, it, it's surprisingly useful and I'll kind of, I'll, I'll bring up in Max in a second and I'll kind of show you some stuff on the screen, but the, the central percussion thing, when you deal with like classification, it's like, if I hit the rim, if I hit the center, if I hit um, a side stick, you, you ahead of time determine these are the sounds. I have these classes. I have 10 sounds that I may hit. Which one was it? But it's not so good at telling you the, so like for example, like the difference between these. There's a change and at some point central percussion would tell you you're using the rim tip or you're using the rim shoulder. And you can kind of have a little bit of a fade between them, but it's interpolating between the classes. Whereas if you have descriptors, it doesn't matter what I do on the drum. I can put I can put a coke can on it. I can I can flip a coin. I can I can do a lighter. I can like rub my hand. Whatever you do, you're gonna get some values. So it means that these descriptors um, are more kind of continuous. So that you can have an not an infinite, but you can have many um, values for centroid. You can have many values for flatness. You can have many values for loudness, etc. So. Um, I, I tried to come up with a way to, when I when I hit the drum, when I get an onset, to have those four, well, I'll, I'll leave pitch out for now because I don't really yeah. use it so much on the drums, but those three bits of information. And with those three bits of information, you can then map those to whatever in Max. Um, so let me share, I don't remember if I sent you this patch or not. Um, so this should be, I'll put my... Uh, not this, I think. Okay, well, I, I can kind of show you here. So at the moment, this is my microphone coming in as input. So this is not making any sound at the moment, but it's just to just kind of show you the numbers. So here's my voice coming in, blah, 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 blah. All right, I'm analyzing um, loudness, pitch, and then um, spectral shape, which gives you um, a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, so this is, um, out of here, I'm getting centroid, flatness, and a few other things which we don't have to worry about now. Okay. Okay. So the louder I am, you can see that this goes up. Yeah. Um, I also have like slowed versions of it. So this is kind of moving slower and this is even moving slower. So if I'm loud for a while and I'm blah, 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 It slowly moves up. Okay. Um, this one's pitched. So if I sing a note, do, 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 you can see this one moving when I'm not, um, Singing, you can see the pitch is jumping all around all over the place. Yeah. Because it's analyzing the pitch of, of my noisy voice, which doesn't really make sense, which is why I don't use it so much for drum stuff. It is kind of useful if you're using like crotales or if you have like toms that are tuned very differently. And then this one's centroid. You see it kind of relates somewhat to brightness. So it's not the... Not moving so much because of you know this stuff, but um, that's the idea. So the darker the sound is, the lower the number will be. Yeah. Um, and over here, I have a version that's doing it for every onset. So um, at the moment, it's it's analyzing the onsets for my voice. But if I do, if I'm quiet for a moment. Um, so I kind of get those different numbers. I'll put like a kind of a, so this is just playing like a drum beat. It doesn't matter what it sounds like, um, but you can, uh, well actually I'll put the sound here so we can. You hear that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's analyzing each of those bits. So for every attack, I have a loudness value, a centroid value, and a flatness value. Mm -hmm. um, so these are specific to each onset. And the nice thing is that you can then take these to map to whatever. You can like kind of make a synth so the louder you are, 
Um, this controls the, vo the volume of what you're playing. The center you can control like a filter or the flatness, you know, whatever, you know. Um, and then here are like basically the real time versions of them. So this is e like this part's easy and this has been like, th this has existed for a long time. Um, this part here is the part that I find a little bit more interesting in that for every attack, then you have some numbers. So, yeah. and it matches perfectly with the idea of the sensory percussion, like um, reliability in a sense. The, 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 I mean, the, um, with the fact that it detects uh, clear transients. I mean, it, they they go along well. I think no. Yeah. 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 So this is a, a slightly more complicated version of that idea. Um, so this is something between con like concat synthesis and descriptor analysis. So we're, we're going to talk about concat synthesis a little bit later, but the general idea being there is that um, those whatever descriptors, so in my case I'm using four, um, you pre-analyze your sounds so you have like this list of numbers for every tiny chunk of audio in like let's say like a file and then you have audio coming in and you do the same and then you just compare them. All right, you're like, I have, I have this and I want the nearest one from the database and it's like, okay, uh, this one and it plays it and it just does that over and over. So we'll talk about that in more detail later, but what's happening in that time is that I'm analyzing tiny chunks of audio and then I'm checking my database for tiny chunks of audio and I'm replacing them. So literally like mosaicing. <laughs> So I've done that for a few years, but I wanted to have something that like, cause that sounds really good, but for drums, it sounds a little kind of chaotic. Cause like you'll be playing and then you kind of get like, it almost always sounds like, cause it's like, it's always doing these little chops, which is great, but it has a sound that I don't always want. Sometimes I want to just be like, I, I hit a, I hit the drum and I get a sample. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, ahead of time, I just take all of the samples, but I analyze the whole file well, chunks of it, and I do it in a specific way, but um, I basically analyze a bigger chunk, and then when I hit this little sound, I find the nearest sample, and I play that sample back. Um, so what this lets me do is I, could, I have like, okay, here's a sample library. However big it, you want it to be, it analyzes everything. And there's basically like a sound world that represents this corpus. Okay, so the loudness is within this range, the centroid is in this range, the flatness is in this range. So if you pet, it's like a three-dimensional shape. Um, now I can play drums and I can explore all those samples by the timbres of the drum. I don't, I don't care what, what sample maps to where. If I'm playing something louder, it'll play a louder sample. And you can kind of like play the sample library without having to be like, give me this and this. Give me this and this. Yeah, this is incredible. Like, yeah. I mean, it, it really becomes like an extension of the instrument and, and you don't have to think about anything else. You just have to play, you know? And, yeah, yeah. And, you and, and there's a time for it. So like maybe sometimes I do want, like when I hit the rim of the snare, I want to trigger this this um, this one pitch of a sound. Like maybe sometimes you do want a specific thing and which is perfectly reasonable. And what I, what I often do is I'll have kind of a mix. I'll have like a bass drum trigger and that'll trigger like uh, specific samples and but then the snare is doing this kind of like exploratory sample um which i find really fun because then you can just take whole like sample libraries like you can just go and like play with like boxes for a bit or, or keys or just make like a whole bunch of tons of sounds you don't have to worry about um i mean you still have to cut them up and do certain things but you don't have to map you don't have to make these decisions you can play the instrument and explore these sounds. Just like if you sit down with the snare, you, uh, before you play, you're not like, when I hit here, I want to hear that sound. When I, you, you just start playing the sounds, you're like, ah, oh, okay, this is how this drum sounds, and then you play with that instrument. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing here with this patch that I'm going to show you is doing that, um, but with some extra bells and whistles.
So let's say like my, I've hit the drum and I'm at like a, a negative eight dB or something. Like I'm at a, like a specific value, but because of my samples, I, I have 3000 samples, which means I have a lot of variety, but maybe I don't have negative eight dB. I have something close, like the closest sample I have is like, so I want this shape and the closest one I have is, is kind of there, but it's not exactly there, but it's the closest. So what I can do is like, okay, I want negative eight dB the nearest file I have is negative 10 dB. So I'm gonna play that file back, but I'm gonna boost it in volume by 2 dB. Mm -hmm. Meaning I'm playing back the sample, but I'm adjusting it so it's closer to what I want. Meaning, so like if I have 3000 total samples, I now have a lot more possibilities because I can play all of those samples at different volumes. Okay, okay so this is a way to kind of compensate for the loudness. Because let's say like the, the I can hit my snare really loud, and the loudest sample I have is is not that loud. So I can play the, the snare really loud and then it's like, okay, this was the loudest one I had. I'm now just gonna boost it back. And how do you do that? I, I know the loudness of the sound I just hit because I've analyzed it. And I know the loudness of the, the recording because I analyzed that before. And then I just compare the numbers. So it's like literally like, okay, I need four and I have 10. So add six, like yeah. you literally do that. So that works fine for loudness. Mm -hmm. I want to do the same for timbre. Okay. So here it gets a little harder because there's no, that I, I can't add for brightness. It, it's not, it doesn't exist. So um, what I've done here is I've analyzed and you'll see it on the screen in a second. Um, Mel bands, which are like, if you think of it almost like, actually when you see those dancing EQ things, our, our hearing isn't spaced evenly, like the way that our ears work. So Mel bands are, are spaced in, a, in like a computed way that um, makes sense to way, the way our ears hear. There's a, a simple explanation of it because I don't, I don't really fully understand the, the mass of how that works. But the idea being that like each band kind of represents an equal chunk in our perception. Okay. So I analyze that. So for every sample, every hit that I make on the drum, I have like my normal descriptors and then I have a whole bunch of Mel bangs, meaning like the, the specific shape of that sound. Mm -hmm. And I've done the same for all the samples in my library. So then what I do is that when I hit the sound, this is the shape of my EQ for my sample. Mm -hmm. The one that I need, the nearest one in the thing is shaped like this. So then I just do the math and adjust them. And I basically apply, like, have you used like a matching EQ, like in Ableton or whatever? Yeah, yeah, sometimes, yeah. So it's basically like a matching EQ, but per sample. So every onset, it's like, this was the shape of your EQ, this is the shape that you want, and it just massages it. It okay. just it just does it like per sample. All right, so okay. let me go back to sharing screen here. Okay, so this is uh, just a recording of me playing on my snare. Okay. So here's a whole bunch of descriptors. So um, the gray ones are the main ones I'm looking at. So I have, um, this is loudness, this is centroid, this is flatness, and this is roll off, which is another another descriptor. Um, okay. And then this over here is the Mel bands. So like this is low frequencies and this is high frequencies. So yeah. for each sound that we hear of this, there's a, a shape to it. Okay, yeah. So this was this loud. Um, this was that bright, etc., and then this is the EQ. So if I just play sounds a bit, so you can see, like as the sounds change, this is sort of the timbral shape that I have. Yeah. Okay. And then what I have down here is um, a, a basically a corpus, a data set of around three thousand samples in this case. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm matching for the nearest one. So whatever the these numbers are here, mm -hmm. actually just the gray ones, whatever the, the gray ones are, find me the nearest one in this um, batch of uh, like a whole bunch of samples here. Yeah, okay. Okay. So if I open this back up, I get this. So I'm just playing back all of these samples were based on on the the recording of the snare. Yeah. So what I've done now is this spectral compensation. It'll take this filter 
Mm -hmm. and it'll apply it to the filter of the sound in here. And it applies, this thing at the bottom is the EQ that applies at the end. So it, it adjusts the, the sounds in the sample library uh, according to what the input is, right? Okay, great. So it gives you like a, a, a kind of a way of nudging the, the, the samples even more. So you get like a little bit more um, like detail or nuance or musicality from it. So if you play like a little bit brighter, it, it makes it just a little bit brighter. And yeah. just to kind of show you here as an example, so I think this here will play the same sample over and over, but you'll hear the EQ change. Mm -hmm. So that's something that like, it took me a little bit to work that out and like the, it, it's also a balance between, for me as well, so let me come out of the share here between uh, latency, because I, I want it to respond very quickly, which makes things very complicated, um, mm -hmm. and not using too much CPU. So um, I'm only analyzing 256 samples, which is very, very small. That's like under under six milliseconds. So it's like, it's, it's so short. <laughs> um, so there's not a lot of information there, but I, I want it to, like it would work better if I waited longer. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to wait longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's, there's like a big trade off there. Mm -hmm. um, and then for certain things, like I want to have, I want to be able to do more and not use a lot of CPU. So, excuse me, that um, thing, the Mel Band EQ thing, I was analyzing 40 Mel Bands. So that's why it's super detailed. But then mm -hmm. for each sample, because if you imagine, uh, well, not if you imagine, the way that I've set up the sampler is every sample you play keeps sustaining even when you play the next sampler. Oh, okay. So in my case, I have, I've set it to 40. I can have 40 note polyphony. Okay. So they don't like, choke each other. Like... No, no. Okay. I mean, you can if you want, and that gives you a kind of a cool sound. But um, for this, each sample is still fading away, even as new sounds happen, including the EQ. So I've applied this EQ to this sample and it's fading away. The next sample has a different EQ and it's fading away. The next sample has a different EQ, meaning I have 40 versions of that same patch all loaded at once in a poly. Okay, so you did it with the poly, and it has like an ADSR like for every sample, or or basically, yeah. I mean, I'm basically triggering a sample for every one. It doesn't need an ADSR because it's just playing its sample, but uh, each one of it has its own filter. Okay. Because I'm applying an EQ, so if I had a 40 band um, EQ in each one, that's going to add a lot of CPU, particularly if you have a lot of voices. So. I kind of downsample and I smooth the EQ at the end, so I have eight band. So I'm analyzing them very detailed, um, both the sample and my input, and I do the maths on it when it's 40 bands, and I'm like, okay, I should apply this EQ. And then I kind of smooth that down, and I'm like, okay, I'll make an eight band version of that to kind of yeah. nudge it. It'd be great if I, uh, 40 sounds better, but like it's, it's a lot of balances. Like it would just use a lot more CPU and if you, because this is just doing one thing, it's just doing a sampler. But if you have other stuff going, that um, crashes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, I mean, computers are getting faster and stuff, but there's still, yeah, there's still limits. So um, that's some of the stuff that I was doing with the kind of corpus-based sampler. So the idea being that instead of mapping individual things, you just have like a, a library that you put in. Um, it analyzes each sample for a bunch of stuff, and then it plays back based on that. One thing that I'm still playing around with at the moment is, so for example, if I have like a sample, some of these samples are like 30 seconds long. It's like, bing. If I analyze that entire sample, um, the loudness of that whole file, so let's say like it goes like this. Mm -hmm. The loudness of that whole file is gonna be pretty low because for most of the file, it's very it's quiet, low. yeah. Um, so I kind of do stuff like where I analyze the first chunk of the file, and I also analyze the whole file and I kind of compare the two and you balance it. Um, Cause for particularly for the sounds that fade away, if you, if you take the whole file, the number is not right. So I'm still finding a balance of, of what size to analyze the chunk of audio for and um, what to analyze for my little one. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so I, I think I have a, a decent balance. So I think I analyze the 256 samples for real time because I want very short. And I think I, I compare that to 100 milliseconds in the files. I think that's what I did for this patch. I have to, I could double check. But there's this problem where I, in real time, I only want to wait this much because, I, as I said, I want the latency. But for the audio files, if I analyze only that much of the audio file, I don't really know a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, because like between whether it's like a bell or whether it's a, a gong or whether it's a drum, like the you have a lot of variations in that first little bit, but not a huge amount. Um, so I, I tend to analyze a little bigger, a bigger of a chunk, and it, I'm still trying to improve that that part of it. But I think in this patch here, it is 100 100 milliseconds for that part. Okay. On my drum, I've got the sensory percussion, and then I have like a, a DPA microphone, like just on top of it. And okay. I'm doing, um, I'm analyzing with both. So the sensory percussion is really good for transients, and it's okay for um, descriptors, but it's not great because the microphone itself doesn't sound that great. So what I do is kind of a mix where I use the sensory percussion only for like checking the triggers, and then when it's like, okay, there was a trigger. I then audioize the audio from like a DPA. Okay. So it's kind of like a best of both worlds. But um, in the case of doing this, like this corpus based sampler, it doesn't matter too much that the sound is a bit shit because all that all that the software is doing is um, whatever your dynamic range is, that's what it's using to play back the samples for. So even if like if the the, the audio quality is terrible, it doesn't matter. It's still sometimes it's brighter, sometimes it's darker. Sometimes it's louder, sometimes it's quieter. That's all that matters. It just maps maps that. Um, by using a DPA at the same time, I think I have like slightly better detail because it's a better mic, but um, it's not necessary. Yeah, is this the correction thing you did? So I've set up the contact mic and the hi-hat again. So here's the audio just from the camera. And here's the audio direct from the contact mic. Doesn't sound great, but it's kind of usable, particularly if you're gonna do some processing. So what I've done to get a better sound out of it is I've set up um, a nice microphone here and then used the Hiss tools to do some microphone correction. So I've created an impulse response that I've run the contact mic through. So here is the room mic again, so just the camera mic. This is the contact mic. And this is the corrected contact mic. So that was that was me trying to figure out a thing which because the I, as part of another well i wasn't directly involved in this project but like the you can do a lot of interesting things with like impulse response and microphone correction so it's basically like an, an impulse response like um like an amp simulator kind of thing but um you just correct for a mic and i yeah i think the video i posted uh you basically have um you analyze the sound oh for yeah what i did for that you record the sensor percussion mic and a, a good mic at the same time. Um, you record them both, you feed them into this process, and it kind of it does almost like a matching EQ sort of thing. It says, this is what the mic sounds like. This is what the mic should sound like. Do that. And it does that. Um, so okay. doing that, I, kinda, I can make the sensory percussion uh, pickup sound a lot better. Okay. And it, it kind of sounds usable if you want to use it for... Um, descriptor analysis it doesn't work for transients as well anymore which which mm. was initial surprise to me but i think doing the impulse response stuff smooths some of the transients out um so i think in a worst case scenario you can do something like where you use the the raw transient but then use the corrected version for um the actual analysis so part of what i want to make eventually for the the sensory percussion tools for max is to have something like where you can do onset detection stuff you can do mic correction stuff. Um, there's one that takes both, so you can take the onset and then the other mic, and then it gives you the other signal, and just a whole bunch of like widgets like this that you can um, do that kind of stuff with. I mean, one one thing that surprised me a lot is that like you're doing all this stuff, like I mean, you're sharing it for free, and like 
I mean, uh, I mean, the world certainly like needs more people like you in this <laughs> sense. <laughs> like, I mean, it's uh, so important, you know. Like, I mean, for for me at the moment, or for other people, you know, it's just learning a lot of stuff and uh for free kind of for free you know just because you like to do that and it's really i mean i i think it's a super important thing to do like even like separate from like um yeah like the the fact that so a lot of what i know is because people helped me so like there's an aspect of it that like okay i feel like i should do the same but separate from that i think it's i think it's an important thing to do in general to help and i think also like i can only make so much music or art you know but like if I help other people, other people can make more music and art. Like it's by by doing things like this, there's just more art and music in the world, and that's awesome. Yeah. I, I can I can I can help chip in. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I'm I'm a big fan of like of of yeah doing all this kind of stuff and sharing all the stuff for free. It's it's kind of funny because particularly with the sensory percussion stuff, like what they're doing is really cool, and um. But like the tech side is all like patented and like like un, like you don't really know what's going on. Yeah. I did some of the early like kind of, of in figuring stuff out because in order to patent something, you have to make a, a patent. And the patent for the sensory percussion stuff explains a little bit of what they do because they have to in order to be able to patent it. So I kind of read through that stuff to kind of try to understand a little bit. I mean, it's, it, it, it's sort of vague because the, the, it has to be vague, but it's also a little bit specific. But with that, I was able to kind of figure some stuff out. I not really, I didn't really apply much from that, um, but it's still, it was still kind of interesting to read through. So I have the, I think I sent you these patches as well. Um, so this is, a, so the SB on set. So this one takes um, just the direct audio from like sensory percussion pickup. I tried to make the messages that it takes uh, match the sensory percussion thing. So they, their sensitivity goes from like whatever to whatever and their threshold goes from whatever to whatever. But inside of it, I apply a filter so I'm doing like a, a sort of, um, it's kind of a little bit of a bump at 5K. And I don't know if their um, sensor is tuned to function, like to have a, a sharp transient in that area. But in doing a bunch of testing, I found this worked really well. Like it made a big difference. So I, okay. all this is applying like a 5K bump EQ. And then in this thing here, this is what's doing the actual onset detection. So um, I'll zoom in here. So this is one of the objects from the Flucoma project uh, okay. that does the amplitude slicing and it does like a differential where it's that thing I explained at the beginning where like you have a slow envelope and a fast envelope and it does this. Yeah, the difference between the, yeah. the two. Okay. So um, I'm applying a really steep high pass filter. So 2K is like super, super steep, meaning like I'm cutting like almost all the lows. Okay. Um, so that's at the start. I'm, I apply a noise floor, which um, they have in their software they call threshold, where anything below a certain amount just gets ignored. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is the fast envelope. So it goes up, it moves up at a rate of three samples, which is crazy fast. So like three, so it's 44,100 samples a second. Um, mm -hmm. There's uh, 40, 44 samples a millisecond. So this mm -hmm. is... Uh, less than a tenth of a millisecond. So it's like impossibly fast. Okay, yeah. so that's how quickly the fast envelope moves up. And then it moves down at 383 samples. So that's still very slow, but that's like five, that's like seven milliseconds. So it goes up really fast and then it goes down really mm -hmm. fast, but l less fast. So it's just super jittery going up. And then the slow envelope goes up at um, 200, 2,200, which is uh, 50 milliseconds. Is that right? Okay. I think that's 50 milliseconds, yeah. So the slow one is moving at like 50 milliseconds, which is still pretty quick. And then the fast one is like, is super triggery. It's like three samples. If, if the volume, it goes up for three samples. And then from there, um, I'm checking for an on threshold. So if it goes, if the difference between the slow envelope and the fast envelope is 11 dB, it's like 
Yes, we've got an onset. Okay. And then there's a lockout here of 10,024 samples, which is, uh, what is that, uh, 25 milliseconds? Mm -hmm. So that's, um, I can, you can make this number bigger or smaller, um, but this lets you do like press rolls and things like this. If the, for drums, um, we're very picky because we want to be able to do things like that. If you're playing like a guitar or something that you're not, you know, you're not necessarily going to go that fast. So that's what this thing does. It, it was, all of it was really, and I had a lot of help from a friend, P.A. Tremblay, who's part of the Flacoma project, in tuning these parts here. Speed of these two envelopes at the rate that they move is, um, I spent a long time, and he, he spent some time as well, just to really fine tune that to work really well with essential percussion. And getting these numbers right was like magic. Like once it worked, and it was like, I was able to do like some of those videos where you can just do like brr, brr, and you have like different samples for each one. Yeah, great. <laughs> um, so this part here, like you could literally just uh, put this in front of your sensory percussion. Like you take your audio from your sensory percussion, put it into there and you'll you'll get uh, like these sort of um, onsets that come out. Yeah. Um, and then there's other ones here that I was starting to build like like the I think this is the microphone correction one. This does that onset descriptor stuff, um, but all of it baked in here together. So like when you get a sound in, like it tells you the loudness, um, the centroid and the flatness. Mm -hmm. So that's what's coming out of here. So even with just with this patch here, you can kind of get some, you can start applying some of these bits. This doesn't do the, the crazy sampler and this doesn't do the classification stuff, but this does like some of the core nuggets. Um, some of the classification stuff, which we didn't really talk about too much, but that's where you like, you train it like, I want this sound, this sound is this. When I play the sound, tell me it's this sound. Yeah. Um, that I have working, but I, I feel like it could be better. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, it might be cool to have like a bit more of like a general or like a kind of a concept, like what kind of stuff are you, cause you, so you, you kind of have a background in sort of jazz um, yeah. and you're moving into a bit more, um, I guess, electronic-y stuff. Like what kind of stuff are you wanting to do? Like where, where you know. Like, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I really like, um, I don't know, concrete music in a way, and electroacoustic stuff and, um, so I'm trying to work with it. I mean, I use like, at the moment, like tons of objects or, you know, I, I built some stuff like this kind of metal things that it, that make sounds or uh, whatever, you know, object I, I, I could use. And um, so I, I the, the idea is like, how to extend, you know, all this acoustic thing and um, make it work with uh, with electronics. And um, also one thing I'm really interested in is like, um, this also relates to my research is like, how to um, like, uh, um, enhance um, super small sounds and uh and and use them to you know produce music or i don't know whatever you know create something with it like i don't know noises or uh, scratches or uh, you know movements or whatever and i'm you know tr tr trying to to find a way to to work with them and um so i was thinking maybe i can you know build my own sample library maybe you know recording all this stuff that i want to use and maybe this this thing with um with the sensory percussion would be a way to to use this uh the samples and uh and stuff and um yeah so that's it i mean i'm actually i'm using a lot like the um, the um, the confetti the thing oh, yeah. you, you did you did for max for life like i'm i'm using it like in different i, I mean i i play solo and uh, in different bands as well and i'm Quite, I'm using it quite a lot, actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for, 
for for doing it for doing yeah. that and um it is like that i i mean using those devices were like was like the um I don't know the the first attempt to work with electronics, you know, and uh, and doing something that worked for me and uh, and it that it sounded like something, you know, like <laughs> not 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 messing around with uh, FX or whatever, and um, it really worked. So so thank you. <laughs> Yeah, one thing that would be useful to do, I, I, I don't know how this works in live, because I guess live is your main, yeah. yeah um, so let's say like you record your objects and sounds and just kind of um, just record and, and make the sounds for a while. Um, for the, the sort of corpus-based sampler to work, you, you sort of need to feed it separate sounds. So um, what you can do with Reaper, I, I, I imagine there's something similar, because I, I think there's in simpler you can do slicing, but... Um, particularly if you have like a lot of samples, it's a real pain in the butt to like cut each one out individually. Yeah, I mean you can slice into a MIDI track like and, uh, and yeah. then you have all these samples, but it's, it's kind of limited I know, in, a, in a way, I don't know. It, it might be worthwhile looking at Reaper. I don't know if you've used Reaper much, but like... Yeah, sure, but I know it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it has a lot of scripts and stuff you can do, but it has one that you can slice audio by loudness. And it does kind of like an onset detection algorithm that isn't super fancy, but like you can kind of slice things pretty well. And then it has a batch export function. So like you you, you put in, let's say like you record yourself playing with these sounds for like an hour or whatever. Um, you tell it to slice everything. You can also tell it to delete silence. So anything below a certain amount. And then you just get left with all these slices. You select them all. You, tell, uh, you go into the file batch export and it'll export all of them as individual files. Whoa. Okay. And that'll save you like hours of your life. <laughs> um, let me, uh, I think, hold on. It's been a while since I, I use it. Let me just share here real quick. So I use Reaper for some stuff, but I, it's not like my main, my main uh -huh. thing. But like, um, so in Reaper, oh God, what was it? Trim splits. Dynamic splits. There we go. All right. So yeah, you, you can adjust these things and you can kind of like, you'll see it change on the screen. Like okay. when you adjust the thresholds and all these things, you can see it in the background. You kind of adjust like where you want things to happen and like the transients and um, whether you want it to split the items or group them and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So like, so you do this stuff and then you tell it split and then you end up with all these like little slices on the screen. And then when you're done, you come here to batch file item X converter. So you select everything, um, batch file item convert. And then here you tell it uh, add. So add selected items. So everything you want to add. And it, it puts everything up here. Mm -hmm. um, you tell it where you want to put stuff. Okay. So on your desktop or whatever. Um, and then uh, how do you want to export it? The, the, how you want to re, do you want to resample it? Do you want to apply fades? Do you want to rename them? Blah, 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 blah. Um, cool. So that's a, a handy way to kind of uh, save you a lot of yeah, manual. Yeah. And I mean, you, you can go in there and you can massage it a bit and basically set like the silence threshold. So like it could cut out bits like where you're in between things and you're not really doing anything. And then um, once you have them, then you can go back and then map them to the drum in this way. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super. I'll try it. I mean, I'll do it for sure. I was planning like to spend hours cutting going on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes like you may still need to go, like you can set all the settings and fine tune stuff, but there might still be some that like the tail is too long or cut the sample too short. And, you know, you might have to still go back and like massage bits. So, um, I mean, I, I want, also wanted to ask you like, uh, uh, a bit um, of of your story, like where did you start with 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 did you start with music and uh, 
the great drums and when you discovered improvisation and whatever i mean a bit of your process process yeah yeah so i started um music very very young so i was uh like four or five years old or whatever like my grandparents were um piano teachers like at, from the conservatory of cuba so i grew up in like um like maybe like a some maybe not great but a somewhat typical like like very strict coming home every day from school and you're playing piano for like three hours and all that so that was like my kind of childhood which was not enjoyable um i think a lot of people look back on it and say that like oh it was you know it wasn't good but i learned a lot and i don't know I'm, I, I don't romanticize it like that so i kind of did that for a long time um and then when i was like 12 or 13 i started playing guitar and my family hated that which meant I loved it. Um, so from that point on, I kind of had sort of two completely separate music lives. There was like classical piano um, and then playing guitar in bands. They had nothing to do with each other, but like they, they kind of get on, went on that way. But if it wasn't for playing guitar in bands, I probably would have quit music. I mean, maybe, maybe not, but like it was, it was something that was enjoyable and it, it gave me a personal relationship with music. So I did that for a long time. Well, not a long time, but I, I sort of did that. And then... Um, the bands that I played in in high school anyways, we always kind of switched instruments. So like we'd rehearse for a while and then like we'd take a break and then uh, like I'd play the drums, the drummer would play bass and the singer would play guitar. And like we just kind of like jammed around but on other instruments. So in doing this, I just started playing drums and bass and other stuff as well. Um, but drums, I kind of started doing that way. And then I think it was the, the first time like I played drums, drums in a band. There was a friend of mine um, had a project and, and they wanted a drummer and they didn't have one. And I was like, you know what? I can play drums in a band. So I kind of like played, I didn't have a drum set. So I just used another friend's drum set, but I played drums in a band and then eventually did that, you know, and then that kind of got me into like the drum side of things. And then for improv, I think some of it comes probably in the very, very start, maybe from playing guitar in kind of bands. Cause like in sort of rock music, there's solos and improvising. Like it's a little bit more big, like in, in, in sort of the classical side of my life at the time, you read, you read music and you play what's on the page and, you know, you do a little expressive, you know, interpretation, but like you kind of play what's on the page. Whereas with guitar, you kind of learn tunes by ear. You, there's a guitar solo you play, you, you, you jam out a riff, like it's a bit more loose that way. And then kind of off the back of that, I think I started getting into some kind of, it was a weird thing. Like it was a mix of like, started playing some slightly weirder classical stuff and some slightly weirder rock stuff. And eventually they kind of, those worlds joined, um, but started getting to like stranger, more improvised music, like John Zorn, Fred Frith and um, things like that. Uh, and then from there, you know. Okay, yeah. So uh, actually it's strange because th this is uh, like the way I started playing drums, you know, I was, right. uh, yeah, like I, I was uh, 12 or 13 or something. And we had like a band in the school and um, you know, the drummer, uh, didn't come to the rehearsals on it. <laughs> okay, maybe I can do it, and uh, and, uh, and then and then it all started. But anyway, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, and uh, one other one other question, like, uh, which are like your main influences, like musically speaking, like I don't know, someone you can think of that was re really important for you. I, I mean, I think for. Music in general, it's kind of hard to say because it's, it's varied so much in my life. I remember when I first like came across someone like Cage or something and like like reading some of his music or his writings and stuff. I was just like, whoosh, you know, like I was in like university at the time. Um, but then more concretely, like someone like like Chris Corsano was a, a like like when I first heard him play, I was like, holy shit. I didn't know that you could kind of, you know, eat, like it's such a, a amazing like broad palette that he can kind of do. Um, and maybe at, like at the start, like when I was doing like solo drum improv, it's knowing someone like him, it's hard to not just do that. And it wasn't until like, I kind of started finding my own voice with it, that it sort of separated from that a bit more, but he, yeah, he was a big, uh, sort of influence and stuff that I, I still kind of listen to. And then, um, I mean, I, I guess, as I said, like earlier when I still played more guitar these days, I mean, I have some behind me, but I don't play guitar so much, but someone like, uh, Fred Frith. You know, yeah. and, and people like that, like like New York improv um, and kind of sort of noisy kind of music was a, a bit of an influence and in, in particularly like how exploratory they were with sound. Oh, hold on. My thing. There we go. 
um, how exploratory they were with sound. So like a guitar was, you could play notes on it, but you can also do like, like a really wide palette of things. And these days, I don't know, it's hard to say. Like I, I <laughs> actually, let me see. I'm gonna open my iTunes and see what uh, recently okay. added. Sleaford Mods. I mean, this no. is not direct influence. It's like a British group that like, it's kind of, it's weird. Uh, actually, okay. the, well, I don't know if this will play to Zoom. Actually, let's see. Do you hear that? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like it's like a. Bosses, drop as a fiver, mate. No worries. So it's kind of like cool. punky, noisy. Um, let's see. Uh, Audrey Chen is really great. Mm -hmm. Fantastic improv. This guy's super amazing. Um, I I came across him not too long ago. Yeah, so that stuff was really cool to kind of hear. So I, that I added recently. Um, yeah, so now Tone is like a kind of glitchy, weird art com composition guy. These are kind of interesting because they're, I first got to know him through like um, his work with like prepared CDs and messed around CD players, but he's done a whole bunch of stuff with like um, artificial intelligence. So like bending the algorithms and stuff. So it's kind of like a mix of some of the stuff I'm into now. Um, skeletons. Sun Lux, which is the the band of um, Ian Chang, which kind of comes full circle of the sensory percussion. Okay. Um, so this is all the music I've added in the last uh, three months to my iTunes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I try to listen to a lot of things and not like a lot of like regular music um, and kind of things along that. And, and yeah, you just take inspiration for a lot of stuff in the world around you, you know. I mean, that's a super cheesy answer, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah. So, so thank you for sharing. And um, yeah. yeah, actually, I, at the moment, I'm I find it difficult, like to, you know, that I mean, I have some so many inputs and uh, like, you know, things that come to me and that inspire me. But at, at the same time, um, I want to get rid of this stuff and focus on my own thing, you know. And and that's a bit hard to do. But uh, I don't know. I'm kind of working on on that, you know. This. I don't know. It's difficult to to face yourself, you know, like you know, like to you know, not avoiding it, you know, like. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a difficult thing, like the the line between like influence and um, like reproduction, you know, like like so you hear something that's like that's super amazing, um, to not necessarily just be like, okay, I want to do that, you know, because like for one, I mean, for some people, like you you try to do that, you won't, you'll fail to do that, but then you'll do something else which might be interesting, which is a, a good exercise. But I think just like, I mean, for me, I, I like taking in a lot of things. And, and I mean, even a lot of these kind of conversations are like really interesting and get things going in my brain and things bubble up, you know, elsewhere. Excuse me. But for me, some of it was kind of like finding a little bit of uh, like a kind of a personal voice, a personal language. And the, the more I did that, it kind of it shrunk down to the snare and prepared snare and these kind of things. And I ended up in that world just out of like, uh, you know. Yeah, things drifting in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Good. Okay. Cool. Yeah.